Welcome to Coming Alive, a podcast with Barry Michaels and Phil Stutz, where you'll learn actionable tools to fight the habits that sabotage you so that you can become the person you're meant to be. Brian Carroll, who performs under the name Buckethead, is one of the top 10 fastest guitar shredders of all time. A world-class guitarist, he has produced close to 300 studio albums. Primarily, he works solo, but he's also performed with Bootsy Collins, Bernie Worrell, Iggy Pop, Viggo Mortensen, and was a member of Guns N' Roses from 2000 to 2004. Brian's YouTube videos regularly top millions of views. And personally, I can tell you that for anyone who loves music or is even remotely interested in the guitar, they are truly mesmerizing. Really, check them out. Search YouTube under the name Buckethead. What his legions of fans may not know is that he is also one of the most generous, soulful human beings I have ever met. For more on Buckethead, go to www.bucketheadpikes.com. Brian Carroll, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thanks, Barry. Um, I want to say thanks for what you just said. That's, I appreciate that a lot. You're welcome. So let me ask you a question that I usually get to at some point in every interview, which is, what have you found in your life that has held you back the most? In other words, in the parlance that we use, what is your part X? How would you describe it? Um, I mean, I'm, I have definitely let fear stop me. Um, I definitely have been cowardly with a lot of things because I'm scared. And um, I think that that fear has just kept me kind of paralyzed for doing a lot of things. I that I know I should do, and I'm constantly trying to battle that. <laughs> mm. Can you give me an example specifically of what fear has kept you back from? Maybe if it's not current, you know, maybe something from your past. Um, well, like just, I, I really, my goal is to make a, like an amusement park. Uh. I definitely think just, trying to call people and develop relationships and I'm, I've had some just tough times with business. So it, it's like, I know that I'm going to have to, you know, I'm going to have to like get it going, you know, and even on the small scale, it's hard to just even call anyone, you know? So it's like, how am I ever going to make the part if I can't even call one person, you know, but that's what I want to do. So it's really interesting. I, I just want to make a point here, which is that um, I never would have realized this until I became a therapist, but making phone calls, particularly cold calls to people you don't necessarily know that well, is one of the things that almost everyone I've ever treated dreads. They dread it. <laughs> it wouldn't seem like that big a deal to just pick up the phone and call somebody. But for whatever reason, that feeling of being exposed, of imposing on someone of feeling like they're going to think I'm an idiot or they're going to feel like I'm, you know, taking advantage of them or something, whatever your projection is, it really scares people. And it's very interesting because the most successful people in my practice are not necessarily the smartest or most talented. They're the ones who make the most phone calls. <laughs> it seems crazy. But that's, that's so interesting. Yeah. So, um, is there anything, are there any tools that you've used that have helped you overcome that fear and allow you to, you know, do what you were afraid to do? I mean, the first time we spoke, you told me about the identity being on the inside or the outside, which still is probably like the greatest lesson. Um, I, I sit, when I think about that, it's definitely given me courage to do things because I, I I'll see myself thinking about oh is this person going to say this or are they thinking that and then when I go to the inside meaning my identity is on the inside I, I, I feel the power of that I can just do it then and I'm not caught up in 
wondering what people think. It's just much, it's quick. It's like, I don't really have to think about it, you know? Yeah. But I have to, it's almost like I can tell the shift in a way, but I, I, when it happens, it just, it doesn't, I'm not really, I'm not really thinking about it anymore, but I can, when I look back on it, I can tell, oh, I was able to do that because I wasn't worrying. I wasn't on the outside. I was on the inside. I don't know if that yeah, no, that makes sense. Let me let me see if I can explain it to somebody who doesn't who's never been exposed to what we're talking about. And you tell me if I'm if I'm getting it right. I think what I recognized about you immediately is that you're an extraordinarily talented musician and that if you weren't willing to make phone calls to advocate for your music or to advocate for the for the amusement park you wanted to make or whatever that in a sense you were devaluing what was inside of you and you were putting other people's reaction to you a reaction by the way that you didn't have the courage to actually experience, but you were just imagining in your head, <laughs> you were putting their opinion over this God given talent that you were born with. And so what I tried to explain is that your identity, you can either organize your identity about what comes back to you from the outside, or at least what you imagine is going to come back to you from the outside, criticism, rejection, being put down, et cetera, et cetera. Or you can organize it around what is already within you that you have to bring to the world. And when you organize it around what's inside of you, then you're more willing to take action on those things and not care what the reaction is. If it's good, fine. If it's bad, that's fine too. I'll just move on to the next action step that I have to take. That's great. Is that a yeah? Good. Yeah. That's a huge. That was a huge thing to learn. So thanks for teaching me. Help me understand me. how that helped you. Did it give you the courage to to make the phone calls, or did you just do what, what? In other words, exactly how did that help you? I want to understand, and I want them to understand internally the shift that took place once you understood that. I mean, it just seemed like a freedom, like a real big freedom of, of not worrying about things and really doing what I felt from the inside. Like when, when you're like a little kid and well, for me, like when I was little, I'd just play and create all these worlds and I didn't have any knowledge of what I was doing. I just did it. And it almost reminds me of that same like opening that door back up to mm. that world of like flow and just like you had said when you first said it to me, you said that that that, that the flow is what you want to honor the flow. And that gets, it feels like that really helps get to that place, you know, that particular awareness of that am I on the outside yeah. or on the inside. Yeah. And then now I try to be in any, I don't do it enough, but I wish I I do notice, oh, I'm, I'm out. I'm not, I'm worried about something or, you know, or, and then I see like, I need to. I think that's really important what you're saying now, because it's what it says is that um, to a large degree, we're not even aware that we're making a choice. We just get worried or inhibited or stuck inside and what we don't realize is, oh, there's a part of me that's actually putting more value on the response I'm going to get from somebody than on what I have to bring that's, to them. That's... It's not necessarily a conscious choice. It's just kind of like a default mode that, that we go to. And at least if you know, wait a minute, no, I'm making a choice right now. And it's not a choice that honors me. It's a choice that gives everyone else way too much power over me power by the way which most people don't actually want to have you know kind of thing. Oh. that then enables you to make a different choice that's that's amazing you know that you know <laughs> thank mean, you it's still like mind-blowing thanks <laughs> so what's the tell us i know i look i've known you a long time i know that you've gone through some hard times what's the hardest thing that you've ever gone through knowing the, and the reason I'm asking you this, by the way, is that the one thing I've learned as a therapist is no matter how well put together a person seems on the surface, every single human being I've ever met 
by the way, including myself, has gone through hard times. And it just helps people to hear about them. Um, yeah, well, really recently, my heart, I have a heart problem where my heart beats out of rhythm. And it's been doing it for a long time, but recently it just really like kicked up into a really intense, and it just, it, I really didn't know what was going on. And I just sort of went, I just like tried to deal with it and let it do what it did. And then eventually it would stop, but it got really intense. So I went to the doctor and they said, oh, you're on the verge of having a stroke. And I'm mm. like, oh, you know, <laughs> I didn't, because I had felt so good prior to having it like you know i was just doing pretty well and everything so they suggested i had this um thing called an ablation so they like go in and freeze your heart and it's supposed to do something with the nerves because it's they, they said my heart was fine it's just that it's it could be a genetic thing they didn't really know but so i i had that procedure and it didn't really stop it and I'm still dealing with it. And I take medication, which is tough because I I never took anything my whole life. I just tried to not, you know, ever take any kind of like anything really. But although I, I eat food or drink something, probably that's worse anyway. <laughs> but um, just uh, so it's been really difficult because it's it's scary and it comes on and it's it, like I feel like I lost like half of my like even walking across a room is difficult. But luckily, the medication, I'm thankful for it because it's kept it, you know, from going berserk. But it's still, it's pretty intense. So, I mean, honestly, having all the tools, using the, like the reversal of desire and the times it comes on, and even the thing we just discussed about, the, uh, I don't know how you would word it, but writing in the journal, because mm -hmm. I like to write in the journal a lot. It seems like now I'm sort of like letting this thing, it sort of exists now in me and I can't really escape it. You know, mm. it's its almost always I'm aware of my heartbeat or aware of the intensity of my heartbeat or whatever. It's just never something that I had ever experienced. So now it's like, it, it definitely kind of scares me. But I also see that it, it's also doing a lot of good because now I'm like, well, I better do all the things I want to do. It, it's forcing me to really, and I've been actually doing a lot of stuff, like even doing this, I feel like I should do it just because I would regret if I did This podcast. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. I wouldn't, I don't know. I just feel like an urgency now more, mm -hmm. which I should have felt anyway, but you know. So the reversal of desire helped you, because you were able to use it to get through the fear that you were experiencing? Yeah, when it happens, I'll use it so that I can calm myself down. Because it's it, if it's intense, which it can be really intense, it, it helps just like, you know, think, I, I don't want that to rule my life. Yes. If my heart goes out of whatever, I don't want to just be sitting around going, when is it going to come back? Or I've, I've like, I'll practice now during yeah. it. I practice lighter because I, if I exert myself, then practice guitar. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'll, it'll definitely. And it's almost like it's training me to play lightly, you know, mm -hmm. more in a lighter way. Of, or, and it relaxes me when I play that way. It relaxes me. So mm -hmm. it's, I'm just trying to use it, trying to get positive things from it instead of just looking at it like, Oh, I'm, here it is again. I'm going to, who knows what's going to happen. Or, yeah. It definitely can take, it's definitely taken me down pretty good. It really sounds like you're making an incredibly concerted effort to turn what would freak anyone out into something positive, which is, which is really the basis of a lot of the work that Phil and I do. Look, negative things are going to happen to everybody and particularly events in your body are so reminiscent of mortality and death that they freak us out, you know, completely and have the potential to stop us in our tracks. But what you're doing, what I'm hearing you're doing is number one, you're not letting it stop you. You're using the reversal of desire to plow through it and keep taking action. Number two, you're actually, um, 
learning to be observant about your own thinking. And if you get too fixated on your heart, you turn away from that fixation and pour yourself into whatever it is that you're doing. And number three, and probably the most important of all, what you said was there's something about this brush with mortality that has actually made you more alive. It's actually made you realize, oh my God, my time is limited. I mean, obviously you already always know, knew that, but I think all of us live as if we had all the time in the world and something like this says, no, I don't. I have to use every moment. Every moment matters. Yes, that's Good. totally. I mean, the day after I had that procedure, I went, I, was, I recorded a record with my friend. I just lied in bed and I recorded it because I felt like... Um, I just felt like I'm here still, you know, I don't want to sit around and mope, you know, and that really came from you. Like just you giving me so much over the years, just building that up, like that kind of strength of like, don't let this take you out, you know, just do it in the face of it because yeah, it could be gone tomorrow. Anybody could be gone. But like I, for me, I was just like, that was a heavy experience. I want to play right now. That's amazing. And I want to, play that experience you know because yeah. i've never experienced something and i was so like wiped out too and there's weird it's weird when you i've really played like in that state before but it's like just to play in that state it's there's feeling in that state you know like yeah. there's emotion in there and i just tried to play that feeling you know i can imagine even even though you were still probably under the influence of the anesthetic that there was still a lot of emotion given what you were going through yeah <laughs> <laughs> what's so funny the anesthetic just uh, you know there's it's, that was weird stuff yeah yeah <laughs> you know so, something about what you're talking about right now makes me want to ask this question even though i have no idea what connection it has to what we're talking about i you, when i watch you on on youtube i you almost get into an altered state when you're playing. Um, it's, it's so clear. And I'm just wondering, what does that feel like on the inside? Like, what, what, are you, what are you thinking? What are you feeling when you're in a flow in a concert and you're just really gone, you know? I mean, I, it's sort of like, I don't know how to put it. I, I love the feeling of it. I mean, I think that's why I like rides because it sort of reminds me of like you're on a ride in a weird way. Like uh -huh. you're just, you're not really thinking, you're just trying to ride the wave or ride the feeling and it just kind of builds on itself. And if you really are gone, you can really get, it's a very incredible state. I, for me, it is, you know, I can't speak for anyone else, but I know that, it's just like you you're kind of away from it. you're you're kind of away from your physical you're just kind of i don't know like it looks, you said it good <laughs> you know but it, it looks it, it's interesting because it looks like your fingers and and you you really should look at these videos because they're they're phenomenal but it looks like your fingers are have a life of their own almost almost like you're having an out of body experience and your fingers are moving by themselves and they're moving so fast. It's, it's incredible. Um, is that, what are you gonna say? is that what it's like? I mean, it's, I mean, I'd say it is if I, if I can, I mean, and you've helped me a lot with that because I know last tour there was a show where I would usually, I remember like a couple of nights before this, I hope this applies, but I had a really, I felt like everything was just, I was, I was like the crowd, I was, because I play in this particular tour, I was playing alone. And so everything I did, I felt like I was getting it back. It was like a, a complete loop, you mm -hmm. know, from the crowd to me, then that, like, it was this incredible experience, mm -hmm. like one of the best one times I've ever experienced. And then a couple of nights later, everyone just standing there. And I heard some guy talking really loud, like off to the side. And I was like, oh, man. Mm -hmm. And I just, but what was so great was I had talked to you. I don't even know. It was really close to this time. 
And you would just say, push, you're pushing, you're, it's, you're giving to them. You don't want anything from them. Mm -hmm. And now that experience, I remember the most because I did that. Like, usually I'd go, oh man, let me just get through this one. Cause mm -hmm. we got seven more shows in the next whatever nights. And I would, I really pushed out, you know, I just said, no, I'm going to, I'm going to, I didn't really think about it a lot. I, I definitely had that feeling of like, all right, I'm going to go up and try to just give it, like try to forget and and go like to, back to the identity thing. Like, don't worry about them. You do what you do and you don't want nothing from them. Like you had taught me, you know? And um, it was incredible. It was like the best. I remember that show more than the show where everyone because I felt a shift from myself that I didn't want anything. And I was, I got deeper and deeper into that mm -hmm. state of like what you said, like your outer body experience. So I felt like, wow, this is, this is awesome. You know, I, I didn't know I could do this under the circumstance mm -hmm. and I don't know if I'll be able to do, I mean, hopefully I'll, I feel like that was like definitely a step, like something changed after that show. Cause I wasn't, you know, thinking about like, oh, they're, they're not into me and the guy's talking about it. I was just, I'm just gone. I'm just going to go for it, you know? Or I don't know. I didn't, I didn't even really think about it. I just did it, you know? And, That's great. And, um, so that was really incredible. It's interesting because as you talk, I really get the arc of the time that we've known each other from the first session where it was really just phone calls. Just your identity is inside of you. You have something to give. Don't pay attention to the feedback that you get from the outside, keep your identity inside. And, and uh, the reason I'm saying this is that anybody can practice this and get to the point where they're standing up on stage alone in front of however many people you were in front of, and nobody's responding to you. And some asshole is talking, you know, in the middle of the performance and you're just in a flow state completely. So to me, that's like the, um, the pinnacle of any creative experience is that you are just in a flow and you really don't care whether people are taking it in or not. And by the way, sometimes people are taking it in, but they're just more quiet about it sure, you know, yeah, than, than yeah. the other audience would be. Yeah. I mean, that's my own mind going, Oh no. You right. Know, like, but I don't, you're right. I mean, I, they could have been, that's their personality or whatever. I just, you know, a lot of people assume that, it's fairly easy to become successful when, in my experience, it takes a tremendous amount of hard work. I mean, if you look at, at Brian's YouTube videos and see the level of technical expertise, you can see that it reflects tens of thousands of hours of practice alone in a room, just practicing over and over and over again. So... You know, it's a cliche, but most musicians seem to suck at self-discipline, <laughs> you know, self-discipline meaning just getting themselves to do hard work. How are you with that? How are you? I mean, obviously, you must have been very, very good at that with with learning music. Um, I, I know I just like I love to do it. Mm. So I didn't think about it. You know, I it didn't even seem like hard work. To I you. didn't see it. I, I, I just. I would just, it just kind of took over, you know, like I just would be in my room playing and that, that was it. Like, I didn't really know. And when I look back on it now, I'm like, whoa, that's crazy in a way, but um, I'm glad I did. Um, I mean, I, I still don't think about it that way. I just like, it just goes back to what you're saying about losing yourself. Like it is still sort of that same flow, mm -hmm. of, you know, you're just kind of, and I mean, honestly, since you've taught me, I feel like I've gotten better at getting back to being more present in in the moment. So if I'm like, because I've been trying to play like classical lately mm -hmm. and I'll try to really work on, I don't really work on it. I just hear it as it's happening and I try to play like very subtly and then very intense, explosive, like a lot more dynamically in those pieces. As when I was younger, I just, they were kind of in a certain, mm. they were just at a certain um, kind of volume or something. Now it's like, 
but it's almost as if I can play my life through a song, you know, or like play Bach, like I was playing this Bach thing. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I played it for a long time, but now it's like, I don't know. I just, this is different for me to play it. I don't know if that makes any sense. It's, it makes total sense. Just elaborate on that, on what you just said, playing my life through a song. I mean, I just, yeah, I, it's kind of having experiences of whatever somebody has in their life. And then for me, the last 10 years have been really intense, like from emotionally. And, but because of that, I feel that it's deepened that part of my playing. You know, it seems like at least it feels deeper to me. I really can feel things more intensely. And then I, can think or even sort of as I'm playing, see things in my mind or have memories and those things can, I can just put them through the music, you know, and it's just different than it used to be. This is, I think such an important point and it's so hard to articulate. So forgive me if I don't say it well, but there's a difference between technical expertise which you definitely have, and the feeling with which you play. And that feeling requires life experience. It requires probably more than anything else adversity, you know, which we don't like. And I think what you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the longer you've lived, the more of that feeling comes through in your playing a kid who doesn't really have that life experience can play very well technically, but it's almost like he doesn't have the substance in him to give it the feeling that an older person can actually. Yeah. I mean, I know I had such a good childhood and such a good life that I didn't experience a lot of stuff until, you know, more recently. And that's just, it's definitely more intense for me now than it used to be. And then especially if I just like really immerse in it and then and I'm present in it, it seems like it's a lot more afterwards. I'm like, wow, I feel like I just went through something. You know, mm-hmm. like I, it's, yeah. it's definitely, I don't know if that relates to what you yes, said. Yes, a hundred percent. Cause you're actually having an emotional experience, even though you're quote unquote, just playing music. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Do you want to say more about any of the experiences you've gone through in the last few years that have really deepened your, the emotional quality of your playing? Um, I mean, um, my, my mom and my mom and my father passed away. So that's been really tough. Yeah. So it's like, I feel like when I play there in, in the music, you know, it's like, because they used to like when I would play to them, you know, so. So in a strange way, you can kind of feel their presence in the music. I, I feel like a communication to them, you know. I feel like it opens like a gate to, to, I don't know, it's hard to explain, but it, it's comforting, you know. It's like a very comforting thing. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, and maybe it reminds me of those times when I was with them and I played for them and stuff, you know. But that's been definitely changed things you know a lot and then I hurt my back pretty bad and um that was another pretty scary thing at the time but like um again like your tools I used a lot of that to help me get through it because I was in pain and I didn't just I never got anything to get myself out of pain I just but I knew that what caused it had to On a deeper level, I didn't really know it, like, in my own mind. I didn't sit and think about it, but I felt it, like, 
you know, what caused this, you got to unravel, you know, which that should be. And then I saw like a shooting star. I was like praying for guidance, you know, like, what do I do? Is, I can't even move, you know, like, mm. and, and then I got like a certain sense of like, okay, just try to, there's an answer, you know, and I kind of just dealt with it. And I found that luckily the greatest thing was I found this book called Foundation and that, that book, I got, I just went online and found the number of, of his names Eric Goodman and I called him and think he luckily answered the phone and mm-hmm. then um, I saw him and immediately the, within the first 20 minutes of seeing him, I, I felt strength, like I felt stability again mm-hmm. through his, his teaching, his, his exercises and then his partner, Peter Park, he, he, they both helped me so much. So that. And these were exercises that literally strengthened your back and your other muscles surrounding the back. Yeah. They're really specific. Like they're not people. A lot of people go, Oh, it's like yoga, but it's a little, it's really specific to like, I mean, I'm not, (laughs) I think it's like really, he somehow figured out a way to, for at least for my situation, it just strengthened all this stuff that that it's very specific though. Like if you're off by a half of an inch or mm-hmm. something, it changes the exercise. So mm-hmm. I I honestly felt like that gave me like a confidence too because I was always weak in that area. I just didn't know it, but because those and that's been another thing that like because I learned about posture, which I've had really horrible posture. My, I've been so shy and I just, and I'm tall, so they don't really go together very good. <laughs> That's what, it's hard to hide of, yourself. Yeah, when... I, I try. And, <laughs> but, uh, but um, so that just forced me to stand up straight, you know, and it's, it's, but it's incredible what I learned. And that's helped my playing a lot too. That's actually helped when I play classical, like, because the posture is so important. Mm-hmm. That actually helped my hands because then my neck, all the compressed nerves opened up because I wasn't hunched over anymore. So, like, it helped up my hands. And then that also makes it easier to play and let that flow happen mm-hmm. because I'm not constricted by, oh, I'm this is bothering me, this hurts, or all that kind of stuff. So that was like a – I really find that my back – issue was the greatest one of the best lessons i've ever had and mm-hmm. but if i would have taken another path or you know if i just would have got out of pain i wouldn't have changed my habits so i'm so mm-hmm. lucky that i didn't change i just i mean i changed i didn't get a quick fix or something like that and it's like my back still whatever it is but because of the way he devised those exercises it strengthens like you said all the all the muscles so I don't really have I still have some stuff but it's not even comparable so that's so I mean those three things have been you know those the heart and my my mom and dad and then the back those are all in the last 10 years and that's what's weird is the year 2009 was the year that you I felt the strongest like you and I I talked to you consistently I felt the most um I showed up for myself. I never missed a day working out. I, Mm -hmm. even when I got off tour, I kept my disciplines really strong Mm -hmm. and then I hurt my back. And Mm -hmm. then it seems as if ever since then, it's just my consistency hasn't been the same. And that year is still like the blueprint for me of like, okay, I gotta, I gotta get back to that place. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, that's kind of. It's interesting because you remind me of, the change that I've seen in you when I first met you, you were almost bowed over. (laughs) Like, like I wasn't sure I could see your face even because you were looking down at the floor and you were kind of hunched over a little bit. And now when you walk in, you're tall, your chest is out, your face is showing like everything is upright and strong. And, there's a obviously a physical component to that where your posture was, you know, terrible on your back and it's so much stronger now. It's so clear that your your body is actually supporting your back and your back is supporting your body. But there's also a psychological component to it where you're not 
hiding from the world, imagining, you know, what it's going to do to you and afraid of it. You're like out there. You just kind of like your posture declares your presence in the world in a much more confident way than, than when I first met you. Well, I mean, I think that all happened too because my mind started to change. Mm-hmm. I mean, like you, all the stuff that you taught me or were teaching me or are teaching me, but it started to change and my body was still, mm-hmm. it had to change. Yeah. yeah. Like it's weird when I think about it. It, yeah. it definitely was like, it can't be that way and, and be. I don't know if that makes sense. It's almost like your body said, hey, I want to catch up with with where the mind is going here. That seems totally real. That's amazing. The other point I I want to reinforce, because you made it so beautifully, is that sometimes adversity, like your back really broke down. I mean, it was you were in a lot of pain. And nobody likes to be in pain, but sometimes adversity can be the best thing that ever happened to you if it kicks your butt and makes you make changes that that you really need to make in your life. I mean, in a weird way, it turned out to be a really good thing that that happened. It, it was. Yeah. And just, I'm just so thankful to, that I didn't do what they were telling me to do. Right. It was just to anesthetize the pain. Or, right. Yeah. Right. And I wouldn't have learned this stuff because yeah. if not in pain, it just doesn't. Yeah. So that was, that's a huge thing, you know, having that just to look back on and go, there's, there's an answer, you know, I mean, the shooting star, that, that was pretty powerful for me. That was I, like a sign for you. That's what it was for me. It yeah. just felt like, cause I was so, in that moment, I was really like, I was just defeated and I was like, what do I do? I don't know what I'm going to do. I just, this is, I have no like confidence in my movement anymore. I felt like I was just going to crumble. And then I saw that and I'm like, okay, that's, mm. that was something to just give me some kind of like, I don't know what that word would be, some kind of like, just don't give up on um, yeah, it was you, like encouragement. Yeah, it was like encouragement. keep move forward, do it. Yeah. Obviously, um, you've achieved a degree of fame, and I'm just wondering if you, if there have been people who have suddenly felt entitled to rip you off or take advantage of you, and if that's ever happened, how have you handled it? Well, I like Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, <laughs> um, I I mean I just for one like with being I don't nobody knows who I like because of they don't I never get like some of my friends are famous I don't not, and I don't know if they would care either way but I don't I'm not ever recognized really so right. I don't really feel like I have any of that going on right so what I see with how they have to deal with stuff. You know? Right. But um, that brings up a, a question that I wouldn't normally ask, but I just know your fans would be pissed if I didn't ask it. So you, um, your nickname is Buckethead and it is Buckethead because you originally started playing on stage with a Kentucky fried chicken bucket over your head Explain the genesis of that. Like, what, how did you come up with that idea? Um, I mean, it wasn't, it just, it, it sort of happened just like, I mean, it wasn't something that I really thought about. I was eating yeah. my father. It was actually a different chicken company. Oh. It was just deli chicken. I don't oh. know what it was, but uh-huh. I was eating it. And I thought I had had that mask and it kind of, I like Michael Myers, so it had a similar quality, but it wasn't exactly the same. So I, I just put it on my head and I was like, I looked in the mirror and, um, and I just was like, oh, that's, that's bucket headed, you know? <laughs> <laughs> 
And then I, my friend went to school. He was going to college and he had video um, class and he filmed me, you know, in that his bucket head. And then I knew this writer at Guitar Player and his name is Joe Gore. And he really is the one that I feel I owe a lot to because, I mean, I do owe a lot to Um he really he encouraged me to do it is mm. that like you should just go be buckethead like go mm. play because i was always like super scared to play mm. and i didn't really link that together i just thought oh this is weird like a weird horror guy i'd like to make a movie about it or something and then when he's like you should just go for it and i was like oh, yeah that would be cool because i i could do everything i like doing as this character that I'm totally scared to death to do otherwise, like I, I couldn't see. do it, you know, if I, and it applied like all the stuff I like, like Disneyland and martial arts and dancing, all that kind of stuff I liked. And I was like, I can't do it just like me, you know? Uh, so that, it was easy to use it all. It's like, that was a great expressive way for me to like get all the stuff out. That's you know? so interesting. So really in a way you were like playing a character on stage but in a way i'm more myself yes because it allowed you yeah, to be more yourself I was so because so nervous to do that stuff right so it's right. almost like i was more that than i was me i was more that's you know. interesting so it allowed you to actually express yourself in a more uninhibited way yeah, yeah. that's great that's interesting. And it was, it's just fun it's fun to me you know, yeah it's like it reminds, it's just a it is amazing to watch because it's hard to understand how you can even play guitar. I mean, did you have eye holes or something that you could? I mean, I sometimes, I mean, no. Or do you get so used to Well, playing? you know, your hands, you just your like hands, anything, you, if you do it, you yeah. can sort of get used to it. It's like your hands know what they're doing irrespective. I mean, I have a long way to go, so I don't think it's that far out there, but it's, I mean, you know, just like you you turn it off and like anything that you're probably when you're writing, you know, just you just don't have to really think about it. Yeah. You know? Like yeah. what we were talking about earlier with the flow and all that yes. stuff. Yes. Yeah. But I mean, I blow it a lot too. So, and then I can't see because I have these eye things on and I, it's hard to see, but I kind of like it because it's, you talked about dusting the audience mm -hmm. and that's almost like. Dusting the audience without dusting mm. the audience because they're like I can't really see everything looks ghost like you know mm -hmm. which is kind of I like that actually mm -hmm. you know? just so the listeners understand dust um, everyone gets scared around performing and I'm using the word performing very very broadly performing can be getting up on stage like you do and playing to you know tens of thousands of people. Or it can be something as simple as talking to a girl who you're attracted to or, you know, just talking about a new subject where you're a little nervous about expressing yourself or, you know, or whatever. Um, what inhibits us in those situations is exactly what we were talking about at the beginning, which is we care too much what the audience and the audience could be 10,000 people. It could be one person. but We care too much what they think. And the moment we get into caring what they think, we get inhibited because you'll never know what they <laughs> what they think. And you too, your mind is too occupied with scrutinizing them to find out what they think. And you lose touch with the flow that you need in order to perform well. And so dust is a tool where you cover the entire audience with a thick layer of dust. It's almost like they're dead. What it does is it renders the outside world non-emanating. There's nothing coming from them because they're covered with dust, you know, type thing. And then the second step of the tool is once you've dusted the audience, just see a fountain of light, but it's inside of you. It's inside of your heart. And your job is to go into the room and light up the room. That's that. So it's about you putting out rather than you getting anything back. Yeah, that's great. Who are the people either in the music industry or outside of the music industry who have, you know, really inspired you? And what is it about them that, that inspired you? I mean, you. Oh, thank you. I mean, in, in a humongous way, you've inspired me a lot. And Thank you. I just don't know how you know what you know. It's 
totally insane. Like, I can't really comprehend it, you know. But, I mean, I think just seeing you and being around you, it's, it's, it's changed me in a way that I'm, I, I'm happy about, you know. And not that it's about me, but from me personally, it's like having you, um, I just, I'm amazed at, at how, how there's really nothing I've ever asked you that you didn't have an answer for that I didn't, even if I didn't understand it in the moment, it didn't eventually come around to being, I mean, it's just wild. I just can't kind of comprehend it, you know, not that I know a whole lot, but it's like pretty crazy. So um, you've inspired me a lot Thank since you. I've known you and, and it's, I think about the things you've taught me a lot. They run through my mind a lot. And it's sometimes really randomly, you know, like I won't even know. And then it'll, like a light bulb that comes on, I'm like, oh, and then I can handle something. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if that applies exactly like to being inspired. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank yeah. you. I, oh, no. I really appreciate that's it. That's the absolute truth. You're one of the greatest people I think there is. Yeah, you know? Thank you. For sure. And then um, Bootsy Collins, he's been like a mentor to me. And I was a huge fan of his as a kid. And then, mm-hmm. like, you know, um, my friend Brain got him a videotape of me, gave it to Bill Laswell, and Bill Laswell gave it to Bootsy. And um, that really changed my life because I got to meet Bootsy and he became like, he guided me through so much stuff, you know, and he did it in a way that was so, you know, just, it was always from a place of feeling, you know, not, not a place of like, you should do this because then you can get this. And Mm. it was always from a heavy kind of place of something that almost like a magical place, you know, and I always felt intense spirit, uh, spiritual feeling with him you know like always you know just to every, even now when I talk it's always been there and and it's hard to believe because that's like one of my heroes and then he befriends me and looks out for me and so those that was like you know and then there's like I really love Michael Jordan I have this poster in my room for I still have it on my wall it's like he just talks about how he in his career, he's missed all these shots and over and over again, I fail and that's why I succeed. And that post, it really just, I love that because it just gives you that feeling of like, you just go for it. Don't mm-hmm. see the failure as, as like a green light and not, a, you know, a red light, you know, mm-hmm. just like, okay. And then there was a guitar player. I love Paul Gilbert. He, the first time I saw him play was at the NAMM show. And I. this is the one memory that I always go to. And he was at the NAMM show and he was in a booth and he was playing. And I was actually, I went there to see Yngwie, who I was like, he, at that time he was, his album just came out and he was, the, you know, the baddest. And then Paul was in some booth and he was just, just it was insane. He was just, ripping you know and he's just sitting there in this booth and like i just never seen he had so much control but he was also it was just it's just like you had said to me one time a long time ago the best way to you know plant a seed or inspire somebody is by flowing in front of them Mm -hmm. and i think that's what that was like he was just doing and it was just it just to this day it's still the most intense memory I have of like anyone playing that makes me want to rip, you know. Mm-hmm. And it's like I wish I had that a video of that, you know, of anything. But and the crazy thing was was I got to know him and he taught me and I have every lesson on I still have all the lessons and they're still and he really gave me a belief in myself that I I I needed because I wasn't around a lot of that so so it was um incredible to have i mean my parents were super supportive but but you weren't around a lot of musicians yeah well people that were like the way he was encouraging and and honestly more than anything it was just seeing him and how he 
you know, more than even him teaching me was how he dealt with his environment because he lived in this tiny little apartment and it was this nothing touched him. He wasn't even aware. He just was so focused on playing and that was so huge, you know, and he was, he just was a great teacher. He mm. is a great teacher, but, and, and at that time I was lucky because he accepted me to take lessons from him. And luckily my mom and dad drove me to him, you know, because mm. he was pretty far away. But like those, the, just being around him and getting to see that, like when you talk about momentum and that was pure momentum. Like mm. he just was, he was just laser, like a laser focus. And um, it was incredible to have been around him in that time, you know, and I just. But it's so interesting to go back to the discussion of identity because it sounds like what really inspired you is that his or his identity was organized around the music, not the apartment he lived in yeah. or anything else. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, even that seeing him at that NAM show in that booth, it was like he was just gone, you know? He was just, I don't know what he would say about it, but to me, that was the baddest thing I've ever seen. Like, because yeah. it was just somebody at the peak of what they could do and they're just doing it like seeing Michael Jordan or Bruce Lee or yeah. to me it's like there's those moments like those are kind of things that you just they don't leave because at least for me they don't leave my mind because that was seeing somebody in that flow state you know yeah you're seeing someone give their all to something it almost doesn't matter what it is but when you see someone give everything that they have to someone to something it's inspiring. It, it, it makes you want to be that good. It, yeah, <laughs> it did. Seriously. I mean, I, my fi I try to get my fingers to look like his fingers, you know, <laughs> I think my fingers grew after I saw him. Cause he has crazy, he's got crazy fingers, you know, so. it's amazing. but um, there's another guitar player, Sean Lane. He passed away, but he's one of the, he's just, He's it's beyond guitar. He's like just a super, like, no. He's just like a, from outer space. I don't know. He's he was probably the most incredible musician I've ever seen or heard, and just like totally. It's beyond what I even can understand. But he, I got to hang around him a few times, and he was like he took so much information and I've never seen anything like that, like where he could just read many books in a day. And he had just like a memory where he could remember everything. And wow. anyway, that, that, that's a whole nother, that's a long story to get into, but he was, he is an insane inspiration. I, it's sad he's gone, but he's not gone in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. you know, like he's, He's probably, I think the people like that, their energy is way beyond their physical self. I mean, I think he'll just, he'll be around forever because it's just too big. Like Bruce Lee's around, like there's just certain people that transcend, like Jimi Hendrix, like they're just, their energy is bigger than their physical. That's how I see it, you know. Well, it goes back to what you said about when you play, you feel like your parents are, in a way, their energy is playing through you in a certain sense. Yeah, that's true. Do you have any questions for me that you want to ask? Um, I want to know if I'm, what you want, I mean, what are the things you see that I'm not doing, you know, that I could be doing better? And the thing with my heart is definitely like, it's, it's it's a it rattles my cages <laughs> or whatever you know it's like pretty intense i just i guess how to handle that or what or how to because you know i i have i get scared sometimes of of a stroke or dying or whatever and i mean i guess that's when i'm pretty weak but but like i'll work out now and my my heart like i'll feel pains that i never felt and those things are like, they kind of are just there now. So I know we talked about it a little before, but I'd say those two things. Yeah. I don't know if those are good questions. They're great questions. Um, look, I'm not an MD, so you've got to consult with a doctor about the medications and what you should be doing for your physical heart. But um, beyond that, yes, there's something 
that I really want you to do in the most disciplined way you possibly can, which is worrying about your heart won't help your heart. In fact, it'll probably hurt your heart. So when you find yourself interrupting a flow state, like you'll be playing guitar or writing in your journal or something and thinking or worrying about your heart when you're not really going to do anything about it at that moment. Number one, I want you to give part X a resounding fuck you. And number two, I want you to immediately turn your attention to what you were doing and throw yourself into it as if your life depended on it, because it does. You know, your spirit depends on it. Your music depends on it. Everything that you were born to do depends on it. And there has to be almost like a little bit of a sense of urgency about that. And I think part of what you brought up earlier and what you've said to me before is that this whole, really this whole decade of dealing with physical problems, but especially this heart thing, has given you more of a sense of like life is precious And I want you to put that into this decision to turn your attention back to whatever it is you were doing and not let your mind fall prey to worry. Again, take care of yourself, but worry isn't taking care of yourself. It's just fucking with your mind. So I would say that, and I would say that in, in general, um, you had that year in 2009, which for a lot of different reasons, everything came together and you were disciplined. And sometimes that's easy. You know, it just, you have a year where that just happens. You're closer to it now than I think you've ever been before, but be tougher on yourself about everything. Just tougher, catch yourself quicker when part X gets you to worry about your heart, be more disciplined about how you organize your time, bring the kind of focus and urgency to it that says, I'm taking my life really seriously. I know I'm going to die at some point. So this moment matters. Does that make sense? Yes. Thanks. Good. Feel free to contact us at info at the toolsbook.com with any questions you'd like to ask us or with suggestions for guests or topics for future episodes. Also, check out our website, thetoolsbook.com, where you'll find a treasure trove of information about the tools, our books, and upcoming workshops, and where you can sign up for our inspiring newsletters. Again, that's thetoolsbook.com. Also, we'd really appreciate it if you'd take the time to review the podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and tell your friends about it too. Talk to you next time.